Hello, I'm Steve Mann and this is Paper Classroom. Welcome to another history tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to talk about mechanical fibre treatment. Now, there are actually two types of mechanical fibre treatment, so don't get confused. One type of mechanical fibre treatment is where we take lumps of tree material like this, where they've chopped down a tree into wood chips, and you feed that through a single disc refiner and what that will do is release the fibres into individual fibres. We can then take those fibres and go on to make paper and that type of pulp is called mechanical pulp and the reason why it's called mechanical pulp is because you mechanically tear the fibres out of the bulk of the wood. If you were to analyse the fibres chemically, you would find it was exactly the same analysis as the tree that it came out of. So the good thing about mechanical fibre production is you take a tonne of tree and you get approximately a tonne of fibres. The other sort of mechanical fibre treatment is where you've got individual chemical fibres. Those are fibres that have been pulled out of the tree by chemical processes and when you put chemical fibres into mechanical treatments what you're actually doing is working on the fibre. You're either planning to cut the fibre to make it shorter which is better for formation or you're trying to increase the surface area of the fibre for better bonding which we call external fibrillation or you're trying to make the fibre more flexible and we do that by what we call internal fibrillation. And we'll learn a lot about that when we get on to the uh, tutorials in the stock prep area. But just be aware that there are two types of mechanical treatment. Okay, going back in history, going back to the beginning, when the Chinese were first working on their fibres, they'd, they'd, they'd taken the fibre from the inner bark of the mulberry tree, they take the little bits of waste silk, they take some old discarded hemp ropes and they macerated them with your, with your uh, pestle and mortar as you see there. Several hundred years later when paper making had established itself in the Samarkand area where they had lots of uh, flax and lemon and fresh water, the Arabs uh, modified these stamp mills. These stamp mills have been used for a long time, often in the mining industry for crushing ore, where these big hammers were lifted up on camshafts and dropped onto the ore. They uh, modified them a little bit to make them suitable for paper making. So now the hemp fibres and the flax fibres and the old clothing were thrown underneath these with water, and this process of hammering would have actually uh, splayed out those fibres, increased the surface area, separated them all. Following the stamp mill, the next major uh, step in working on fibres was the collar gang. This was invented in Germany and as you can see it's almost a modification of something like a, a wheat grinding setup. So in the past you have put dry wheat in there and crush it and, and get your flour out. It, it was modified a bit. You put water in, you throw your fibres in, in the form of raw flax or linen, uh, flax or uh, linen clothing. And those big, heavy granite wheels will grind up the fibres and produce a material suitable for paper making. Probably the most important invention in working on fibres was the Hollander beater, invented obviously in Holland around about 1860. And what we have here is a tub, we have a wall that runs down the middle that's known as the mid feather, you should remember that term, mid feather. Here we have what we call a beater roll, side view there. So there are bars on the surface of this beater roll. This here is a bed plate. There are bars on the surface of the bed plate. So the bed plate has a concave surface and the beater roll sits in it. 
the beta roll can be lifted or lowered to produce uh, more or less pressure. As the beta roll turns, it causes the water and fibres to circulate. In this area, the fibres get worked on when they get crushed between the bars on the, on the bed plate and the bars on the beta roll. So it circulates round until the stock is in the form that we need for making the product that we want to make and then we stop it round about here there's a plug you pull out the plug and the water falls down onto the next floor of the uh, making house into a big tank and then off we go to make paper or blend it with other things so that was the Holland that's Holland beta one of the biggest best inventions the problem with the Holland beta of course is it's a batch process and today everybody wants to move away from batch processes onto continuous processes and that's why you rarely see beaters around. So the purpose of the beta is to put individual fibres into it and to work on them to give them the properties that the end user wants. In an earlier video we also mentioned uh, the groundwood process. The groundwood process, this is a process of taking a whole tree uh, and reducing it to individual fibres. Not working on the fibres, just separating out all the fibres. So here we take whole trees, the log, and this is, if you remember, it was Keller who invented this. There you've got the big grindstone. Here you've got a carousel that's holding a set of trees or a set of logs. The weight of the logs causes friction here as this turns. The friction causes heat. The heat softens the lignin that's in, in, the, uh, in the tree. And because the lignin is now soft, then as the grindstone goes over the surface of that tree, it can rip out those individu individual fibres causes huge amounts of damage to the fibres but at least you get individual fibres and if you remember both Kelly and Fanetti offered those fibres to uh, a mill that made uh, newsprint paper. <clears throat> Moving on from his first generation of um, groundwood pulp he then came to this one TGW is thermo groundwood pulp so the clue is in that first word thermo there's more heat there. So what he did, he's still got this carousel, he's still got his logs, he's still got his grindstone, but he's introduced hot water. So the idea of that is the hot water produces more heat. That means the lignin will get slightly softer. That means when you tear out the fibres, you'll do slightly less damage to them. So you'll have a slightly higher average fibre length. That real process has completely disappeared now. What we are left with though is this third process, PGW, pressurised groundwood pulp. So again, we've still got the grindstone, we've still got the car carousel of logs, but now we're applying extra pressure. The extra pressure will create higher friction. The higher friction will create more heat. That will soften the lignin more. And therefore, again, when you rip out the fibres, you'll get less damage than this process. In addition, they also used to inject steam under pressure just to produce even more heat to cause more softening of the lignin, so less damage to the uh, fiber, final fibre. That process only releases individual fibres. It doesn't do any work on them. Back to the type of material that works on fibres, we've now got the Jordan Refiner, invented in 1858 by Joseph Jordan, an American. And what we do here is we bring in a slurry of fibres and water here. It travels through this machine this way, going to increase in diameter of the cone, and it's ejected there. Essentially, the Jordan Refiner is a modification of the beta. They've taken the beta roll with its parallel sides, they've made it a slight angle, about 15 to 17 degrees, 
and then they've taken that bed plate and wrapped it around that angled that cone now so there are the bars on the rotor the housing or the stator because it's stationary will also have a set of bars and as the fiber does travel this way it will get trapped between the bars on the rotor and the bars on the stator and hence you'll get work done on the fiber Moving on from that, uh, in 1893, George Claflin, another American, invented the Claflin refiner. And as you can see, this is just a, a slight modification of the Jordan refiner. All that he's done is increase the angle of the cone. It's gone from 15 to 17 degrees to 60 degrees. The stock still comes in at the narrow end, gets trapped between the two lots of bars, and is ejected from the wide end. Everything else is the same. It's said that Claflin refiners are slightly better at fibrillating fibres than Jordan's, and it's said that Jordan refiners are slightly better at cutting than Claflin's. The next step in the evolution of refining was the disc refiner. The first disc refiner had two discs, a stationary disc and a revolving disc that rotated against it. You feed stock in through the middle of the disc, it works its way to the outside periphery and then comes out. Now, because there are two discs but one working surface, that's known as a single disc refiner. The picture here has three discs because, and it, therefore it has two working surfaces and therefore it's called a double disc refiner. So there's a motor attached to this disc which will rotate. This is on a hinge that will fall in. So this surface will rotate against this fixed surface. On the other side of here is a similar pattern disc that will fold in like a door. On this door we have another motor here that will fold in and this disc will rotate against the back side of that disc. So we have two working surfaces, therefore a double disc refiner. And there are other generations, there are, there are triple disc refiners and quadruple disc refiners. The reason why everybody is moving to disc refiners and away from conicals is simply one of economics, nothing to do with performance. It's purely economics. With the conical discs you've got a huge chunk of metal making that cone that you have to turn and therefore it costs money. Electricity. It costs money to turn those cones and the bigger and heavier those cones the more money it costs you to turn it. Even if you don't put any fibre through and that's called the no load power. These discs are a lot thinner and a lot lighter than those cones and therefore it's cheaper to turn those. So the no load power consumption of a disc refiner is much less than the no load power consumption of a conical refiner. It's probably not worth throwing out a conical and replacing it with a disc. The payback time will be too much but if a conical fails then you should be thinking about buying a disc. Well, that's the uh, end of this uh, tutorial on uh, the mechanical action on fibres. I truly hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, please watch our other videos and uh, please give us some feedback. Have a good day.